So first, I'd like to bring up the president of Tucson Silicon Valley, Aisha Gudinis, uh, to come uh, speak with us. And then uh, we'll also have Deepak Tunja come speak. And then we can get started with the panel. Thank you. Um, so welcome. Oh, OK. Yes. I just <laughs> wants me in the picture. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Uh, so many new faces, and you know, probably half of the room are the folks that we've been to our events before, but half of the room, uh, room is made up of folks whose very first time they're attending. So welcome. Um, maybe I should kick it off by saying a couple of words about what, what to see on Silicon Valley Network is all about. Um, we formed this forum by our previous um, to see our president, when he came here together with actually Simone Kaslowski, who's our current president. And they said, well, do you guys have an organization for the Turkish folks who live here, who are professionals or entrepreneurs? And we're like, no, I think we were like five or 10 people around the room. And they said, well, if you, you know, uh, move this forward, we'll support you all the way. So since then, um, me alongside with a handful of volunteers who are in this room, um, who's been doing tremendous work, um, is dedicating themselves to bring the professionals in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco as well, and the entrepreneurs. And we kicked this up around two and a half years ago, I think. So our focus so far has been a couple of things. Number one, um, to make sure that we, the Turks in the Silicon Valley, get to know each other and network. The, as you guys know, the different nationalities here really support each other, their government support them, what have you. Here, we don't necessarily gel together, talk together, spend time together. So I'm actually hoping that via events like this, um, you can find opportunities career-wise, personal-wise, and get to, get to know the folks um, who live here or who's been living here for a number of years. Um, the other intent we have is we have a really close tie with the headquarters in Istanbul of Tusiyat. As you know, they do represent the top 600 biggest companies in Turkey and pay probably 80% of the taxes in Turkey and a huge contributor to the economy. Um, from that perspective, Tusiyat is very dedicated to make sure that um, successful Tur Turks who live outside of Turkey um, do give back to Turkey. And there is a bridge between the companies in Istanbul and um, out in different parts of the world. So one of our other efforts, and we haven't necessarily made much headway on this, but we have a big program coming up, is um, to build that bridge and build some mentorship um, relationship between the folks here, the professionals, and entrepreneurs um, with the Turks um, back um, in Turkey. There are two committees we have. And the first one actually is the professionals one. And thanks to Hayat Coach, big applaud to her. This is the very first event that, um, that we're holding. And uh, Hayat and the folks have decided to go really focused and have a summit on uh, sales and marketing um, today. And she found us this fantastic guest. And thank you. Uh, we're honored to have all of you here for the first time and meet you. Um, but our intent is to get professionals, not necessarily just the entrepreneurs, um, get to know each other and learn from each other is, is one of the purposes of today and this committee. And Ipek will, uh, right after me, will chat a little bit about that. The other committee we actually have is the Entrepreneurship and Mentorship Committee. And in that, that's a very um, active committee. For two years, the folks have run a program last year and um, we got together close to 100 people, um, half of them entrepreneurs, half of them folks, Turkish people from different walks of life, where it was basically a mentor and mentee relationship. And we basically tried to handhold them, introduce them to different people, and gave them um, coaching and support in different areas. And that, that continues to be a focus um, of this, of this uh, network. Um, and if you're, and I, I met at least a couple of you who are entrepreneurs who are new here. So Burahan, who's standing at the corner over there, belongs to that committee. Go talk to him, be a part of it, and then um, let lets you get um, engaged in that. Um, so basically, just at the bottom line of this is we Turks um, have to support each other. 
Um, there is a whole world out there back in Turkey that we can get support, vice versa. We can give back to our country. Um, so I do encourage all of you to put your hand up, volunteer, um, and see how, how you can support this effort. And if nothing else, at least get to know a couple of people today that hopefully will be beneficial um, for you in the future. Um, before I give word to Ipek, who's the head of our professionals committee, I do want to give a deep thank you again to Hayan for um, this fantastic presentation. Um, of course, as well as our wonderful volunteers, I choose over there, Burahan is there, Hayan I talked about, Ipek is here, and then a bunch of other people um, on the phone. Uh, as well as back in Washington, D.C., who helped us. So welcome, and I hope to meet you right after this event. Thank you. I'll the chart since Aisha did such a beautiful job of summarizing everything and getting everybody excited. Um, happy to represent the professionals committee here. Our goal is to you know, really foster this amazing community of Turkish professionals in the Bay Area and do a lot of activities that hopefully will give more opportunities for networking and create value for everyone. So I'll net it out. Two asks we have. Number one, please do let us know what would be of value to you. What topics, what formats, what frequency, etc. We would love to know so that we're making sure that what we put together is most um, utilized, if you will. And number two, reiterating what Ashley has already said, please do volunteer. We appreciate all the efforts of those folks like I am today. Um, it is much more valuable when it is owned by the members of the community. This is all of our community, so let's make it even more productive, even more collaborative, and without further ado, oh, uh, we are planning the next event of this series in the February timeframe, topic TBD. So it's even more important to just speak up to help us gauge exactly how we should orchestrate the next one. So with that, I'll give the Thank you. Um, so I wanted to do this event on sales and marketing because I'm really passionate about sales and marketing. And I believe it's an area that uh, a lot of people have misconceptions about, uh, about really what it entails. And I also think, uh, especially on the sales side, it's the most challenging for Turkish professionals who are coming to the US. There is a language barrier and there's a style barrier. There's, it's it, the most different, I would say, than other um, careers, and other uh, from Turkey and kind of transitioning here. So um, I really think it's an area where we should um, leverage people who have expertise in this area. Um, quickly, myself, I'm also uh, in sales. I'm an account executive here at Salesforce in this pretty building in the tower. Unfortunately, we're not the top, but uh, the top is usually closed for private events that are booked out a year in advance. Uh, however, I'm always happy to uh, take people up to the top here. We have someone else from Salesforce here on our panel, and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves soon. Um, but looking forward to the event, I wanna keep it as interactive as possible, but I'll start out with some questions for our panelists. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd love, instead of me you know, introducing and reading off a boring biography, I'd love for you each to introduce yourselves, um, tell us about your role today, um, and kind of what brought you there. So can I keep it off with Ozan? My first step uh, from uh, Salesforce. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Ozan Yusuf. It's actually nice to say Ozan to all of them, virtually. <laughs> Uh, I uh, have been in the U.S. since 98, so quite a long time, but I came to do a PhD at Stanford in supply chain management, but then ended up going into consulting to McKinsey, then did corporate strategy at HP, and then now um, in the strategy and operations world at Salesforce. Started with sales strategy and operations, did that for five years, and now in customer success strategy and operations. So quite a journey to get Oh, thank you. Um, this is Gizam Ozbay. Ozbay. Thanks for reminding me. I am with Avid right now, Global Marketing um, Director for Avid. Uh, I came to the US, I had to do the math actually, when I was preparing. It has been 10 years. 
Um, I started uh, with PNG, so maybe taking a step back in Turkey, I'm a proud uh, Middle East Technical University alumni. Um, <laughs> right. um, I joined Programming Apple right after school in Turkey, so I was with their marketing organization for about five years. Um, then I moved to Boston uh, for uh, with their uh, global marketing organization, um, which was a very exciting but also a challenging move, going back to moving to, I think, any commercial role. Um, from from Turkey to US is uh, interesting, exciting, challenging, learned a lot. Um, thought I would go back in two years. That was my commitment to the company and kind of coming here for as an expat and I'll, I'll go back and then life happened. Um, you know, I, I started taking on different roles um, and growing in a company which was really exciting. Um, so I ended up staying here, um, you know, for 10 years. This is my 10th year. Um, I left PNG in 2015 and joined Abbott. Um, and again, I'm part of their global marketing organization right now. Very happy to be here. I'm Edi Zardikin. I've been here since 89, 30th anniversary, quite a bit of time. And again, as was Zem said, life happened. I came here actually for graduate school. I'm a proud ETO alumni at <laughs> Istanbul <Stop with laughs> University, computer engineering, and did graduate school here in San Diego and moved here. Spent a couple of years with Chevron, then I realized big company life was not for me. I came to Sybase, spent several years on, in the support organization, become a product specialist. And there's a gentleman in the back there, far right back, who hired me to the startup called Informatica. I joined Informatica in a couple of years. We took Informatica public. Since I basically stayed with startups, only zero to 25 million building businesses and helping them on the commercial side, typically driving sales and marketing journey. Uh, I mean, I enjoy the space. Currently, actually, I am with a company. Well, I shouldn't say I'm with a company anymore, anymore because we sold the company to a bigger company as of last month. Uh, I was at Hedwig running sales and building the business uh, as of last month. We had a great exit, sent it, sold it for about 225 million to Calmold, which is a bigger public company focused on data management and uh, data recovery. So now looking into the new journey. Oh, congrats. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're not yes. shy. <laughs> Just both no, no, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I could have retired with Informatica, so yeah. say, I'm going public less than a day. What are you going to do if you retire? That's the problem. <laughs> if you have three yeah. kids, that won't be a good role model. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, I'm Haluk Ubuwai. Um, I too am an uh, ETO alumni as well, uh, in electrical engineering, electronics and computer science, grad school including. And then came here as a software engineer. I started working for Alcatel in Istanbul and uh, came to North Carolina, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, um, as a software developer. Did my uh, you know, R&D days, um, managed teams, and then decided to move to the dark side, as my uh, friends called me at the time, to marketing. So <laughs> did, did my MBA at UNC Chapel Hill, so I'm a dark deal as well. Um, and um, moved to product management. That's the closest thing you can get from you know, engineering to, to marketing, really. That's the best way to start. Um, and then one thing led to another, I spent, well, I came here, by the way, in 87, so I beat everybody on that one. Uh, 32, it's been 32 years. Um, uh, started with Cisco, stayed with Cisco for 12 years, and it was like a university, another university for me. You, you learn so much in big companies like this. Um, did everything from services management, professional services, solutions engineering, and ended up with demand generation. That's how my demand generation career kind of started. Uh, ran a couple of big teams and then moved to Juniper Networks um, and did a couple of years at Juniper. Um, and then I went to a couple of startups. Right now I'm a senior director of marketing at Riverbed Technology. It's been four months or so. That's my story. Great, thank you very much. And actually, small world. Uh, so, uh, Haluk, uh, his previous company uh, was one of my customers here at uh, Salesforce. I cover uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley, and he's at a uh, 
Silicon Valley Cybersecurity Company. So you asked us uh, for an icebreaker. Yes. <laughs> but, but uh, I'm going to say mine in Turkish. <laughs> 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 so, I would love for um, everyone just to have a little bit of an icebreaker. Maybe talk about a recent um, a show you've liked or a podcast you've listened to, something that you could share with us that you have enjoyed recently. I just started reading the book Range by David Epstein. And I had previously read Malcolm Gladwell's book on outliers, and which was all about specialization and how you have to go deep and the 10,000 hours, and oh my gosh. And my whole life I've been a generalist, so this new book actually speaks to me, talks about why generalists survive in a specialist world, so I recommend it. I recently watched the movie yesterday, maybe some of you watched it already, the Beatles story with this average musician who's getting hit by a bus but the gist of the story is quite interesting actually nobody knows Beatles basically mm -hmm. then after that accident and uh, he's kind of getting all that uh, all that why to introduce those songs as new songs and people felt fall in love and there's a big dilemma of course hey should I say it? it's me or not me <laughs> and that dilemma about being honest open versus maintaining that course, hey, my songs and getting rich, uh, you should watch it. Thank you. Um, maybe TV shows then, to pick another um, example. Um, there are two that I've been following for the well, past few years. Um, one is Leave Amsterdam, it's actually just like the second season right now, it's on the, the medical community. Uh, which is interesting and relevant for my job as well, and the, the other one, This Is Us, and they just started their new seasons last week, so um, I really, really enjoy the fact that they're much shorter than a lot of the TV series, so you can be done in half an hour instead of three hours sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. And I asked for that because I want, going back to what Ashibi was saying too, the point of this is getting to know one another as people, um, knowing our expertise and making sure that we are really, um, you know, getting to know one another. Okay, so um, let's start here. I'd like to start here with Ozan. So you spent, you know, your career, your background is in strategy. Um, you're now in a sales strategy role. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you think are the key components uh, of building a successful sales strategy? Sure, so it depends a lot by company, I think. So prior to Salesforce as an HP, an HP was a very mature company. You know, it was pretty much flat revenues, trying to say flat revenues. Um, very established sales teams. The sales strategy and operations there was more about how do you improve productivity so that you can get away with fewer account executives but still sell as much, right? So the problems were very different and the challenges you faced were very different. At Salesforce, it's all about growth. And um, one of the statistics that our CFO chain, uh, was sharing is we're the only company, if you look at US public companies, that has managed to grow over 20% for over 15 years. We've, we've done that now for 19 years in a row. And I think there's only one company who's done it more than eight years. So from eight years to 19 years, there's only one company that's Salesforce. So the growth really fuels this dynamic of how do we get more account executives? How do we add more? How do we slice the pie even finer? How do we do this every year? and that chase for growth and how do we pump enough capacity is a totally different challenge than I've ever seen. But it really is about how do you create that growth and uh, what I would say there was a philosophy around trying to improve productivity by bringing specialist sales teams to kind of support the core account executive. What we've learned over the past two years is that it's not a good strategy and there's a certain level of productivity by segment that really hasn't changed if you look at the last 10 years. So it's better to just add more account executives and increase your coverage and grow that way. And uh, it's the secret sauce at Salesforce and it's been kind of the secret sauce behind the growth as well. So just reinforcing that model and making sure you go to the bag. But it's that delicate balance of figuring out can we really get them to sell a lot bigger portfolio of products uh, to a fewer set of accounts and still see that growth. So that's the biggest challenge. Great, thank you. Um, and I'd like to now move over to Ayuse. Um, hello, Ayuse Bay. 
So um, I, you've spent your career very much on the execution side of sales, uh, sales and marketing, but sales primarily. And um, I'd like to know, I think this is, it's a big challenge for companies who are trying to grow here in the US, especially Turkish companies. And uh, I work with, I mentor a lot of startups and I, it's a big number one challenge. So what would you say are some of the skills? How did you become good in sales? Um, and what are some of the skills and how do you think others can pick up those skills? Thank you. So, I mean, if I were to go back maybe briefly, in 1993, I came to Sybase. So at that point, I came, I joined as a support engineer. And I always had the heart, or had the hearts for selling. So I interviewed a couple of years back to back. I went through five, six interviews. Keep in mind, we're talking about 1993. I mean, if you look at the sales force or even marketing during those years, mostly Caucasians, Americans. So, and believe it or not, I interviewed with 10 people to move into a pre-sales role at Sybase. So, after that move, I enjoyed, I mean, I mastered what I did. And that's one thing to start with, mastering really what you're zooming in, being an expert, being great at it, starts with being articulate, understanding your subject, and also engaging with your audience. Well, that audience, if you have a senior person in the room, you have to make sure you don't lose that senior person catering to everyone else, especially in a sales situation. But with that said, uh, then I came to Informatica, as I mentioned. I mean, I learned quite a bit from Clive, who's, I mean, I would highly recommend. He's also a sales executive exec for many Clive, years can you now. Give He's helping time? actually many, <laughs> many of these companies venture uh, to move to US and guiding them. But I learned quite a bit from him. I moved from pre-sales role to sales management without carrying quota or carrying a bag by myself. So the main driver for that, I mean, first of all, I mean, you need to be able to ask for what you want. That's what sales is about. If you want to get the deal done, you need to figure out, and you cannot be shy asking about it, very simple. And if you're shy, if you're not able to ask, if you're hesitating, oh, I already asked last week, I already asked. I mean, I called him also four or five times maybe. I was leaving him messages, that was 1998 <laughs> to get the job, but to be able to get the deal, I mean, if the rep today, when I interview a rep, if that rep is following up, and provided, of course, the interview goes well. I'll get to that in a second. But the first thing is that persistence, really the natural drive to engage, connect, and show the other side you want to be able to help them, you want to be able to support them. Or if you're a rep, hey, you really want what, and I believe actually I'm trying to teach it to my kids, no matter what you're trying to do, not halfway, you need to be able to show the other side you really want that. If you show, communicate, then most likely you'll make it happen. So now if I were to come back to skills in that domain, I mean, you're in the same domain. Uh, in a startup, if you look at the zero to 25, like at Informatica, the company we took public, I managed a business zero to 70 million building from zero. I was the first guy who moved to Europe uh, and then built a business. And since uh, we took that company public, since we came back, I worked with both founders of that company, building the sales of, uh, building the sales organization, and also supporting the go-to-market strategy and marketing efforts. But common denominators that enabled success, I mean, think about early stage company, clock is ticking, venture money is drying, I mean, you have to go get next round of venture capital. Well, it's almost like eating up from your savings, no different. So. In that equation, you need to figure out where is the immediate wins? Where can you get those immediate wins? And one is to be able to uh, either bring the network connections. So I consistently look for those connections alongside the skill set. And one is to be able to communicate also, understanding what I'm trying to sell. I mean, what I'm trying to sell. If you're getting a good understanding of what you're trying to sell, you can articulate, you can talk about it, but more importantly, you can also hear. So that brings me to the next point. If somebody comes to me and spends 45 minutes of an hour interview 
talking about themselves, I don't see them again, it's very simple. One is to be curious to understand really what is the role of God, what are we trying to do, what are we trying to achieve, accomplish as a business, what is the mission, and they have to buy into that vision and mission. So, I mean, next point, fire in the belly. Maybe not so much on the skill side, but fire in the belly is the big thing. I mean, you don't wanna basically push people. Have you done this? Is this done? Is this completed? You need that natural instinct. If one comes to a sales organization where the clock is ticking, they have to act with certain sense of urgency to get things done. A sense of urgency is a big deal. I mean, otherwise, well, guess what? You're gonna run out of money, very simple. Uh, but besides that, the DNA around persistence, of course, several things I'm looking at, the resumes, for example, track record. It may not be applicable to someone who is new, but uh, I mean, when you are hiring in a startup uh, environment, you're looking for that five to 10 years experience in the space, naturally, because you don't have the time to train people. That's one of the challenges. You can bring engineers, certainly, to build the product, they will contribute. But at a very high level, these will be the data points I would love to share. Thank you. Uh, I agree with all of those. Uh, and I would also say, I think there's a misconception that sales is just personality-based, like, oh, I'm an introvert, I can't do sales. I mean, I think being an extrovert helps, but if it's you have to do your homework. It's like an engineering job, but you're trying to figure out what will make the other person across from you tick. So it's a skill, and you need to go to meetings prepared, having studied the people you're looking at, the organization chart, how to influence. I mean, sales is, uh, I would say, one of the most challenging roles um, I've done in my career, and I've done investment banking and consulting. So also what are typically known to be a little more challenging. So with that, let me move on to exam. Um, so Gizam has spent her career in marketing, as she mentioned, um, and what really is interesting to me is she transitioned from CPG marketing uh, to pharmaceutical industry. So can you tell us a little bit about that transition? How is marketing different in those two industries? Um, yeah, please tell us. Of course. Um, I think, a, you know, funny anecdote is, you know, when I was in school, I was so clear that I wanted to be in marketing, and I was so clear that I wouldn't do marketing in healthcare. That was a clear criteria. Little did I know, obviously, that the life was going to happen again. Um, but I think a lot of people focus on kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's different about different industries. And healthcare, of course, is a regulated industry. So, so is CPG actually yes. to a certain degree, or banking, or finance. So, um, for me, the principles of good marketing do not change across um, industries. And when I say this, I'm definitely not the most favorite person in the room, because um, there's this proportional focus on um, domain expertise, there's this proportional focus on the shiny object of the day in, in marketing. So uh, even I cannot catch up with the different titles that are coming up in, in marketing. And even in the hiring process, when I meet people and talk to them about the basics of you know, uh, marketing and their experience and that, um, a lot of them are missing it. So I would say you know, marketing overall is really going through an existential crisis in terms of like redefining what marketing is, uh, which is a very interesting um, Phenomena, but you know, just at a very high level between um, consumer and healthcare, there's of course consumer facing healthcare companies as well, and there's pure, pure B2B healthcare companies. So, if I were to generalize maybe B2C versus B2B, um, you know, I still do see a lot of similarities. Um, you need to know your audience really well, um, and that audience is different. Uh, of course, when you're talking to a physician, that's very different than talking to uh, a, 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 you know, a mom with a newborn. Uh, but again, the fundamentals won't change in terms of being consumer focused, you know, generating the insights and driving growth for the company. I think, you know, a lot of the marketing professionals and even the um, CEOs uh, kind of lost belief in, in the marketing function. Uh, again, when they got sidetracked by, you know, what they should deliver uh, for the organization. Um, and I actually recently listened to a podcast, which was amazing, that I would recommend to everyone that's interesting in mar interested in marketing. Um, it's by CMO Moves, um, and uh, Mark Richard and um, Antonio Lucio from Facebook uh, are, are doing a podcast, and they're talking through this existential crisis in marketing, and actually there are more similarities between you know, B2B and B2C companies. 
um, and kind of you know trying to reinfuse the passion in marketing in, 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 uh, for, for the newer generation, which for me was very interesting. So I think overall, um, I do think the principles do not change um, across the two as long as we keep the focus on driving growth for the company uh, versus you know again tactics or technologies that might be just readily available for that kind of um, you know a shorter term um, time frame. Um, and you know, the, from a skill set perspective, and you know, I'm sure, I'm sure we can have a whole separate discussion in terms of how there's confusion in between marketing and sales. What does marketing do? What does sales do? And again, for sales, um, you know, there's there are a lot more tangible, uh, obviously, outcomes shorter term um, that you can um, deliver and show to prove the value of what you do. Versus for marketing, I think emerging technologies. Um, especially in the past 10 years or so, um, trying to prove the value, attribute value to what you do, attribute value to brand building, um, you know, has become harder, but again, it's not impossible. There's enough companies out there that have been doing it for 100 years, 150 years. I was lucky enough um, uh, probably to be a part of, you know, two companies, p and 170 plus years, you know, Abbott has been around for about 140. So it's amazing that again, the playbook and the principles of doing it right actually doesn't change a ton. Um, of course, the channels change. Of course, you know, there's new technologies. You need to keep up to date with that. Um, but again, I think as long as you keep the focus on, um, you know, growth uh, for the company and, um, you know, uh, principles of good marketing, it's actually not that different in my mind. Great, thank you very much. And that was a good segue because I want to ask Haluk, uh, your focus has been on demand generation. And Bizan just mentioned channels changing. That very much uh, impacts your job. Can you tell us a little bit more about how demand generation has changed, what exactly it entails, and especially at high tech companies? Yeah, uh, okay. Yes, it's been changing in the last eight to 10 years. Uh, overall marketing, especially in the demand gen area, uh, huge changes has been going on and still, uh, still they do. So first thing, uh, about growth, right? Driving growth, definitely. So um, up until again, eight, 10 years ago, it's, it was all about number of leads you bring into the company, you make it into an event, how many people register, how many people attend it, and conversions, etc. Today, I'm responsible for a pipeline number. So marketing was a cost center. Uh, we are trying to move it from being a cost center to a profit center, really. Um, so when I say uh, I have a pipeline number, this means how much of my investments to marketing is bringing to the company's bottom line. So uh, for this, uh, and I'm talking talk about I'll be very specific. We're talking about marketing sourced, marketing teams sourced uh, pipeline. Pipeline being uh, a number that sales takes and then they'll uh, work on them and uh, hopefully you close business uh, on that pipeline. And typically it, uh, it's three to one. So if you wanna sell a million dollar uh, you know, uh, re revenue, if you wanna make a million dollars, you need to have like a $3 million pipeline, more or less, it depends on the company. Uh, but, uh, and I can also say very easily today, going beyond uh, bringing that pipeline uh, as marketing, uh, it would be, uh, it's pretty typical for uh, for marketing to bring in, uh, well, being asked to bring in 10%, 15%, and sometimes 20% of that pipeline. So my company, uh, you know, more or less makes a billion dollar sales. Uh, that means we have to generate $3 billion pipeline, uh, you know, on average. If, uh, as marketing, I need to bring in 10% of that pipeline, it's $300 million a year. That's huge, right? Never seen that before, uh, up until 10 years ago. Now that's all we're talking about. So to make that happen, uh, right, I need to bring in new technologies. I need to bring in, and I'm B2B. I've always done B2B, and I thought actually B2B and B2C have been pretty different, but you're saying they're actually coming together. That's, that's great, because uh, the, the technology is driving uh, this convergence, really, uh, and uh, phase shift is, is pretty similar to backend. Um, but for a good marketing demand generation program, right, there are some foundational pillars. Uh, your audience, 
how to segment that audience and how you target that audience is, is very important. Um, and uh, things like actually Salesforce and other, other technologies help us do that very well nowadays. We didn't have those capabilities before. Um, the content became really uh, very important. It's always been important. When I say content marketing, uh, you know, if you're in the technology area, for instance, you'll receive emails, etc. Download this, download that, and look at this ebook. Um, we do that at the back end. But uh, the problem is, uh, people, uh, an average person, if you're looking for, if you have a pain point, and if you're looking for a solution, um, you consume about eight to ten content pieces. Uh, you download stuff and read, or you go to websites and read, before you even consider uh, a vendor. What does that mean? Your time is valuable. I have to give you value. I have to think like a customer. I'm not selling a product. I, uh, I'm thinking about what is uh, you know, your pain point? Uh, what are you trying to do? Understand that uh, I had a very good point. You have to do your homework. Uh, it is hard. Uh, you have to do very methodical. Uh, you need to go into details. Who is this person, right? We have this ideal customer profile concept. Who is who has been buying from me, and where do they live? How many children typically do they have? Uh, do they read Time Magazine or New York Times? Uh, do they go to picnics or do they go to baseball games? I mean, that's all available out there, and we have to use it, and we do. Um, using all that audience, okay, too much on audience. Uh, content I talked about, uh, and then uh, you have to use the backhand technologies. Um, I talked about that one too. For instance, right, uh, technology-wise, um, we have these intent platforms now. Uh, not only we know what, what your uh, you know, typical um, you know, features are, like how many kids, etc., uh, but we also now uh, can know if you work for a company, how does that company engage with what I'm doing? Uh, we have different ways of uh, do, doing these things. But uh, I can say, hey, I'm targeting, uh, say, um, 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 Merck or you know, um, a healthcare company, maybe an insurance company. I am able to look at that company as a whole and uh, say, Five people from that company came to my website five, uh, this week. And they've downloaded this many. They've downloaded this many other things from my competition because I have to meet my competition. All that come to, uh, come together and uh, become the intense data that I can also purchase through platforms. Um, so um, these uh, shifts in technology really changed uh, marketing and it will keep changing. That's why one little advice, two little advices, and I'm done. Uh, one, keep yourself, whatever you do, not just marketing, but keep yourself up to date, right? You have to read. You have to go to uh, events. The Reinforce is coming up. They have probably it's one that, <laughs> there is a, right? The for Salesforce, right? It's a big event. There is one day usually you get a pass for free and go to that to talk to the vendors. That's what I do if my company doesn't have the money to send me to the course. It's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, a second one, second advice and I'll be done. Um, and this was talked about before. Uh, as Turks, we kind of come from that interesting culture where we say, again, I'm gonna say Turkish, our own Mola desinler. Söz gümüş ise sükürt altındır, right? Uh, yes. Shut up, don't say too much, because that's how you f you show uh, no. That is the opposite <laughs> here. <laughs> Be yourself and you talk to yourself. Uh, you know, uh, speak up and, and talk to people. Let them know what you're doing. If you don't, nobody nobody's gonna do it, and somebody else will tell them, and that person is gonna go. Great uh, advice. Uh, so I have two more questions for our panelists, but I want everyone to start thinking because I will open up to Q&A. So get your questions ready while you're listening intently. Uh, so my question is, and this is for everyone here and whoever wants to, whoever wants to speak up first. 
Um, so I think I'd like to know what is uh, what you love most about your current role, and then something that's challenging either about your role or the industry you're in. For me, what I love about my role is the people that I work with. So as I've changed jobs, I've followed people that I like working with. Uh, and that's been really the criteria that I choose in going into different jobs, different roles. Uh, I also do like that the fact that we have a great product portfolio at Salesforce. The feedback that we get back from customers is great. So I feel it, I get a more upward spiral than when I worked at HP and the feedback was always bad. And so you were going on the downhill spiral. Uh, you know, we, we kind of jokingly say at Salesforce, there's a little Kool-Aid when you show up in the office. <laughs> Lots of furry animals, lots of yes. fun things. Um, grass and, down below. Grass down below. Bingo. Um, and so there's definitely a theme that's fun and playful and it keeps it very light and motivating. Uh, but the challenging part, of course, is that the heart of Salesforce is a startup. And yet, you know, we're now 45,000 people. So I always struggle with the fact that we don't have processes and we haven't invested in technology for ourselves as much. And so how do we, when are we going to cross that chasm of becoming a big company and when are we gonna make that investment? So that's what's kind of looming. So for me actually, uh, let me ask you this, maybe show me some hands. Who likes to go spend their day every day again and again with the same people and do the same thing again and again? <laughs> Somebody hand. raise your hand. No, <laughs> so that's really what keeps me excited in sales because every day is a new challenge. You work with new clients, you hear their stories, you hear their challenges. And what keeps me going is more than anything else. And especially if you enjoy that, I mean, that kind of fuels you in sales. Uh, dealing with that puzzle, navigating the maze, and finding the solution. You solve their problem, and when you solve their problem, you cross the finish line as well. And and of course, in sales, when you cross that finish line once, it's not over. The next race is already started. So if you like the <coughs> dynamic nature, I mean, that's a great place. That's what I like, that's what I enjoy. Otherwise, you cannot survive in sales. I'll take the other side. I'll go before you switch back. Uh, so yes, I mean you show up, right? Same place, same people, every day, five days a week. But that, that in, on the positive side, that's a team, right? Uh, if you work as an individual in a marketing uh, in, a, uh, in a marketing department, you will get bored really fast. But if you build that team infrastructure, team environment, people support each other especially on the mid-sized companies like I've been working for in the last uh, five to seven years. That's even more important because I don't have enough resources. Everybody has to put in 110% of their, uh, what they have. So if you build a team all together, then you're all in it together. So that's when you start having fun. You can go out and things like this, you know, have, have lunches, and, and then do work at the same time. The challenging, uh, and also second, personally, I'm an engineer by education, so I love data. So one of the marketing, especially in demand generation, is data analysis. Data, analysis. you launch a program, you measure it. If you don't know how to analyze that data and see what's going on and adjust, it will just die. So I love that part. I'm very familiar with it. I like to work with it, all this data stuff, which is great. Uh, challenging part, and I'm going to throw some uh, ball on this on this side. It's really sometimes right, tough to get aligned with sales. <laughs> sometimes, because sometimes you all, all, that's all just the ninety nine percent, uh, one percent sure, sometimes. Sure. Um, uh, because you're not really invited at the table first. You have to really, uh, you know, put your effort. Uh, be get get close with the sale uh, sellers on the sales. I understand. I mean, I put more than thirty years into this career. So everybody has quotas. You know, every month, every every week they have meetings and what's going on, what's going on. It's really tough thing to do. 
uh, who has the time to spend an hour with her every week? Nobody does. But you need to, right? <laughs> so that's when you have, I have to kind of, uh, you know, show my, I have to show up and I have to prove myself, right? I need to speak the same language. That's where knowing Salesforce as a marketing person, for instance, right? Or another CRM, let's say. Yeah, really <laughs> important, right? Uh, so when I talk about this is how much pipeline I'm bringing to you, uh, oh, let's talk more. Can we do more of this stuff? Now you're talking. Now marketing is at the table, but that's a challenge. You have to work on it. It doesn't happen automatically. Okay. I'm going to actually start with a question as well. Who is happy with the healthcare system in the U.S.? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, the, the opportunity is huge in healthcare, I think, in general. But it, as a marketer, it's the same. Um, you know, the, you know, I try to see the glass half full, uh, and the opportunity is really huge. And it's, it really sounds cheesy, you know, when I say this to people. But after you know, like working in consumer uh, for ten years, the purpose of the company uh, for me became really important. So you kind of joke and say, I, every company has improving lives in their you know mission statement, right? Mm -hmm. And then you talk about cardiovascular, which is the space I'm in. You're literally talking about life and death. That, you know, that's what you impact ultimately, indirectly or indirectly in the company every day and when you kind of walk into the, in the shoes of the customer, stand next to them one day or you know, just do a ride along with a rep and you just you know, remind yourself how important you know, these products are for people and it saves their lives. So that's, that definitely keeps me going um, in healthcare despite the challenges. Um, and you know, again, from an opportunity perspective, I think that disruption in healthcare is gonna happen a lot faster than a lot of the other industries. You know, again, it's way archaic. Yes, there's a lot, you know, there's the payers, providers, no one truly understands where the money is going to. You're spending, you know, crazy amount of money on the system and it's still not efficient and the metrics are, you know, far below a lot of the OECD, you know, uh, uh, countries. Um, but then you think through the possibilities. If you're, a, you, know, you know, if you like to imagine the future in a different way, it's such an amazing industry, because now you're down to the personal data. You know, you're talking about genomics, you're talking about actually personal health devices that you are able to, you know, not only, you know, understand what's going on, but also predict um, some of these diseases. It definitely opens up a lot of different possibilities for outcomes, uh, you know, health outcomes in general, but from a marketing perspective, it's huge. Again, it used to be this, okay, rep is in a, with a doctor, what, you know, what, what sales aid um, should you know, he or she use? And now we are talking about what if you connect the dots between you know, the diabetes device that's monitoring you know, the um, glucose levels for a diabetic patients and help predict what could happen from a cardiovascular disease perspective. And how can I get, ultimately, again, going back to the principles of good marketing, the right people at the right place at the right time. So I'm not, not only driving revenue for the company that I'm working at, I'm helping save lives and I'm actually driving revenue for my key customers um, you know, as well, which is, I think, again, very exciting. The transformation the healthcare is going to go through in the um, next five years, I don't even think it's going to be 10 years, actually, um, is, is pretty exciting. Yeah, I'd say, I, so I, I did consulting before this and I did a lot of healthcare consulting and the industry was changing so much even then, um, and it's come so far from then, the last five, 10 years, so it's crazy, I agree. So I have one more question. We talked about, um, when you mentioned staying up to date in the industry. So on that note, I'd love to have um, each of you say maybe one or two of the ways that you stay up to date. What are the resources you're using? This could be events, publications, podcasts, uh, associations, anything. Probably don't do enough of this. Uh, for us, and part of it is when you're the leader in the industry, <laughs> all you're really looking at is, is anyone coming close? So you're kind of looking behind you and saying, is anyone coming close? But there's very few things that you can look at. There was, I know from McKinsey, I can say this, but there was a McKinsey study saying, oh, customer success and how it's evolving, here's the latest thinking. And I look at it and say, oh, that's what we did three years ago, and we know it doesn't work. So nice to know, but <laughs> we're ahead of that. Um, one thing we do, I guess, is um, for our customer success group, we have a person responsible for scanning podcasts, scanning the news, scanning industry events, and synthesizing it into a daily news outlet. And so that's where I look at for the most part because it has 
a selection of the best of the best is relevant to my job. So that's what I do. Um, and then by and large, I think from our leadership team meetings and Dreamforce, we bring a lot of influential speakers in and many of those kind of give you an idea of where the industry is heading. So that's what I do. So from my perspective, I try to keep it simple. Thanks to internet, there is, I mean, a tremendous information overload there. And if you try to kind of digest, uh, trust me, it's not gonna be do much. So I looked at several things for headlines to track, I mean, on the social side, LinkedIn and Twitter, on the data side, uh, TechCrunch, Crunchbase. Uh, and these are really the dominant news where I track. And I also listen to TED Talks. I mean, there is really great content there. So I mean, if I were to look, these are my main information sources. Setting alerts, I mean, if you're using IT, uh, what is it, ITFF, for example, you can set a bunch of alerts uh, on anything you wanna track. Lately, I'm tracking, for example, artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's kind of the next thing I'm looking closely. And then you can set your alerts and here we see the, those alerts on any write-up, any new company, any new fund. So that's my perspective. Um, I agree with, with, with a lot of what it is shared from our resources perspective, especially tech. I think being in Silicon Valley is a privilege. Um, it, there's almost too, too many things going on at once and you need to really be choiceful and selectful, but also, you know, dedicate the time to Ozan's point, make it a priority so you're staying relevant. So there are a lot of great events, not only, you know, company-led events, but, you know, thought leadership events that I really find helpful. Um, some are industry-specific, um, you know, some are more technical, uh, you know, by function, so I, I, I make an effort to at least be at an event once a month either to learn something new that I didn't know, and again, it's just the, the possibilities are endless, right? It's like trying to keep up to date with even like AI. Um, there, there was an AI conference literally in our backyard across the office um, last month I walked in. Um, and you know, you, you know, every time you kind of walk into those conversations, you realize how much you, you still don't know because it's changing so fast. And the application of those technologies in different industries, you, you know, start looking at those use cases, I think that's pretty amazing to stay up to date because, again, a lot of the customers that we ultimately face are interested in those technologies. And I think, again, um, Silicon Valley is a great place for that. And I think the downside of being in Silicon Valley for a lot of us is the long commute. So I have a terrible commute. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, so that's the only uh, you know positive side of the long commute. Um, and I think it's it's just a you know great amazing format in my mind where you can you know you don't have to be distracted, you can still be driving. But um, you know there's you know a variety of great um, influencers you know from different industries as well as, as great topics that you know I try to pick up uh, every day. Yeah, all of them, uh, but uh, for my career purposes. So I already mentioned Dreamforce, uh, great event because people will come here and set up shop. You'll see demos and listen to topics. Even if you don't go to the main keynotes and things like this, uh, still a great opportunity. I also try to go to Serious Decisions Summit uh, every year or every other year at least because that's where the man Jan is talked about. And also, that's a great opportunity to network with people. I'll add, maybe old-fashioned, but reading as well. <laughs> uh, read a couple of books. If you're uh, thinking about going into marketing with a uh, startup company, uh, read guerrilla marketing, right? And learn what you can do with a little bit of money, not a lot. Um, quick. Um, anecdote here, I interviewed, I'm interviewing with this startup, they have 15 people uh, bringing sales, they're gonna hire first marketing person. And uh, I'm, the guy is like, okay, what would you do? Uh, and I did some homework, I'm like, I can do this, I can do this, and he goes, I don't even have a marketing automation system. Uh, we're just thinking about getting sales force. I got nothing, so what do you do? So that's a really different mentality. So for me, for to run my big, great programs, I have to have marketing automation and uh, customer relationship manager for software. Anyway, um, uh, if you're uh, uh, crossing the chasm, is still relevant. Mm -hmm. Learn it, 
read it. Um, it's a great book. Um, uh, and TED Talks also is very, very good. Yeah, and you bring up good points. I, I asked that question, one, yes, so we can learn about how people are staying up to date in their industries, but as someone in a sales and marketing role, you need to be really curious, like we talked about. I've always been naturally curious, but read a lot because then you have a lot of things to talk about. And you're talking a lot. That's Everyone here talks a lot, right? So or you need to in your role, probably more than an engineering role. And if you know a lot about lots of different things, you're just more interesting. And you can talk about, you can make small talk, you can have conversations about different topics, you can tie different topics to each other. I think it's a really useful skill uh, in sales and marketing. So with that, I'm gonna open up to questions. So don't be shy, and I like it, nobody is. He was first, so I'm gonna quickly. Thank you uh, for setting this up, Shiad, and all uh, people, this is great, I think. In Kenyan courses, that this is a very important subject that you know, we do not talk a lot in Silicon Valley. People have this misconception about Silicon Valley, it's all about tech. Exactly. Whoever comes, visits Silicon Valley, I tell them, it's, you, you can find the best sales and marketing people here. That's why you should come here, not for the tech talent only, necessarily. Anyway, uh, I'll start with an icebreaker. People watch how busy I'm good. So we can take it maybe after that. So I, I have a question. So what we are seeing is I'm seeing an important trend, two trends happening, and this is one is specific to Silicon Valley, the other is affecting all these industries. Outsourcing is, uh, and uh, automation, right? Those are maybe two disruptive trends that we are seeing. And in terms of outsourcing, we are seeing even complicated engineering tasks being outsourced, outsourced outside the Silicon Valley because it's darn expensive here, right? So it's hard to do engineering here. Then people would ask questions, why would I keep my sales or marketing teams in around Silicon Valley? And then the other one is automation. I'm a professor, so I have a hard time uh, t telling my students to build a career in sales or marketing because sales and marketing is one of the jobs that has the biggest, highest risk of being automated in 15 to 20 years, right? So, um, what, how, how they should, so what parts, so my question is about that. I am seeing that you guys are not fully agree to say this. It's great, so what I want to see that maybe how, what are the things that, that uh, need people or people who want to build their careers or sales and marketing should build on so that they, they are not being affected by this outsourcing threat as well as the automation threat. What they should be focusing on building their career towards. So um, outsourcing is definitely a trend, and I think to the extent that the time zone allows it, we as sales are trying to do that too. We're trying to become more global. We're trying to put a lot more jobs in India. HP had 300,000 employees when I left. 100,000 of them were in India. Right? So I think that's a real trend, and that's not going to go away. Uh, in terms of the automation, I don't believe sales and marketing jobs are getting automated per se, in the sense that um, if you look at all startups in the Valley, there is a sense that when they're very small, the product will sell itself. There's social media now, there's all these networks, word of mouth, I don't need sales. So as an example, Slack said, I don't need sales. It's a collaboration platform, I don't need sales. It's, you know, this is an empty pursuit. And uh, one of my direct reports actually went to Slack to build out the sales strategy team there. First year was miserable. No one's paying attention, no one believes in sales because they think the product is so good, no one needs to sell it. It sells itself. But lo and behold, two years have gone by and they are seriously in the how do we sell this thing? How do we get into mid market, higher enterprise? How do we make sure that once we have a small set of users, we then go full blast and try to sell this thing and they can't get enough investment in it? So I think. It's fine to say at the SMB level or at the consumer product level, you don't need to sell. But the enterprise sales jobs are never going away. Because you know, to your point, it's the toughest job. It's a job of understanding what does this person really need? What does this company really need? And how do I create a solution for them, not a bundle of products? And so that discovery is always gonna be a very consultative process. And people can download as many white papers, can read as many articles, they can 
go and try to check out online and you know fill out shopping basket and have licenses but no one's going to build a solution for them it's going to be you know people like i am here so i don't think that job is going away anytime soon so uh, automation does impact us. Uh, I mean marketing. So telesales, right? Or telemarketing can be outsourced, and they are being outsourced uh, to India, to Ireland, and other other South Africa and other uh, places. But that's that's really the uh, first step of marketing and sales. Uh, tele telesales, telemarketing is a machine. You just make calls. 100 calls every day, boom, 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 you move on. But the intelligence, so we are in Silicon Valley, if you're in Silicon Valley, in Research Triangle Park or Boston, Austin, uh, that's where these ideas come up, right? That's where we keep the edge. And as a marketeer, if I take advantage of that edge, nobody in India, nobody in China knows this stuff yet. It will take two years, maybe. They will get there, but I am two years ahead of them. So I'm not too late. Nobody's gonna get to it. My job is not gonna get to it. It can't be automated. Because again, you have to do the hard work, just like you're saying. Uh, it's not just automation. You have to do the hard work, understand uh, why people don't, uh, why people now think AWS and Azure are just too expensive sometimes because they charge crazy. Uh, for instance, right, it's one of the ideas there. What can I do? Hybrid, do we do hybrid cloud? And you get into technology, you start talking about, thinking about what they need, that can't be automated uh, anytime soon. Maybe artificial intelligence will do it in 15, 20 years, but I, I don't think so. Yeah, I think, you know, for any profession, there are gonna be components that are gonna be automated and should be automated. We are even discussing this with surgeons, there's you know robotics now. But it really depends. The come the answer becomes okay, it depends. There are times probably the patients are gonna prefer an automated machine answering their questions, like a, you know, having a physician available 24-7 is different than I'm I'm having a heart attack, I wanna to talk to a human being about what's going on. I think same is true for marketing. It depends on again the definition of, of marketing. I think that's where we need to focus the energy and you know um, force the new generation to really be this you know good business stewards. Ultimately, understand the PL, you know, understand what what drives growth for the company. Be able to connect the dots as much as possible because really marketing ultimately is all about behavior change. There's a lot we can do to probably understand, compute data, and automate the tactics but it's really hard to anticipate human behavior. There's this great book that I love uh, about human behavior that's uh, predictive, uh, predictably irrational. Uh, really, we think we're ra rational human beings, but a lot of the decisions we make are really irrational at the end of the day. Um, so understanding psychology, uh, either at the individual level enter or enterprise decision making, you know, trying to anticipate, you know, give scores to the companies and anticipate what they're going to do is not still 100% accurate. Um, so I think, you know, net net, if we keep the focus on the, the fundamentals of running the business versus tactics, um, then, you know, there's a role for marketing and that's where I think the, 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 the um, new generation needs to focus because probably half of the technologies we're using is going to be irrelevant you know, 10 years from now. So that could, might or, you know, might not be automated, might or might not add value, but it's again, are you to answer your question on is that adding value um, is, the, is the most important piece in my mind. So I'm, I'm not that afraid about, you know, actually, you know, the, the AI taking jobs. It, it needs to take away some jobs. It creates more jobs, I think, every conference that I've been part of. Um, it creates more jobs than it, than it kills. It's part of the reinvention, it's part of the innovation process, which is which comes at a cost for certain people. Um, but I think trying to see the bigger picture in terms of what does it enable ultimately is, is very exciting. So I think the new generation, um, even the education system, when you think about it, is so outdated. Um, and if you're in the education system, maybe you can speak to it more, but it kills me now. My son is in kindergarten, I'm like, really? You know, 50 years ago, you were doing it the same way, and you're you know, still doing it very linearly. We need, you know, creative problem solvers in the future versus, you know, computers, if, if that makes sense. So I think that's an, a whole other interesting challenge in terms of, like, are we even educating them in, in the right way to be capable of solving tomorrow's problems? That's, that's very interesting. So 
So my talks actually, I, I always like to use examples and analogy. I mean, Netflix, Blockbuster, right? Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Autom automation, regardless of the industry, will eat up a lot of jobs, but it's gonna create in parallel a lot as well. That's the reality. I mean, think about it today. I'm sure you have iPhone, right? Or uh, maybe a Google device, so something. All of these guys have marketplaces and there are so many things you can just buy without really interacting with any salesperson. I mean, if you go to open source, viral products are similar, right? You download, you use, you don't even interact with a salesperson. You just watch YouTube videos, you just, well, look, I, I, it's difficult to predict the next 10 years, but the reality, there will be certain level of human engagement may not be directly what we are doing today, the way we are selling. Because even the way we are selling, if I look at it last 20 years, changed quite a bit. I mean, think about 10, 15 years ago, none of this information was available on the internet. So now with marketing automation platforms, with assets we generate, we try to feed those through different channels, syndication, directly, indirectly, and everybody has access to them. But hey, the sales rep, uh, or sales engineer or marketing person, somebody still has to assimilate, somebody still has to interact. Could be a day, probably, also not far difficult to predict and how those jobs will change. I mean, there are definitely great examples of those viral products and you buy it today, right? I mean, anything you buy, the games or applications you buy on iPhone or Google phones, right? you don't interact, you don't buy it from anybody. So, a little bit, uncertain in my view. There's a question back there, go ahead, speak loud. All right, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, I work in tech and I've observed, so far I've observed some division between the way R&D teams are organized versus sales and marketing teams are organized. They, these are usually very separate within companies. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you bridge this gap to improve your processes and outcomes and how you also made sure that you didn't over invest in using R&D to improve your outcomes. So, I mean, the way I look at it, while R&D is quite important to the mission, I always separate it and I always had the sales, pre-sales, marketing teams because this, as soon as you start interfering, interrupting, needing their help, then everything is basically getting delayed. So there's typically resources around product marketing, product management, who are tasked to bridge basically uh, the field, field force and what you do, what you hear, because we cannot just build a product without hearing out, well, I mean, this is the difference between leading edge versus bleeding edge, right? You need to hear right, what is table stake, what needs to be part of a product versus what is my founder's vision. Hey, that engineering typically starts with that founder's vision to build whatever you are building, hopefully it solves a problem. But the thing is, for the salespeople to be able to carry that forward, somebody has to be able to translate, all right, what problem are we aiming to solve? And then feedback, okay, for us to be able to expand. I mean, Salesforce is a great example, right? When I used Salesforce first time 18, 19 years ago, it was a, I mean, great product for that small organization. And at that time they serviced SMB, well, over time learning how they can take over Siebel or Oracle, now basically they, they move from the SMB space to the next level. But that didn't happen just because of R&D and engineering. It happened listening to what happened, what the customers are asking, what the, what the customers needing. And same thing in the early stage business as well, in my perspective. I think if, if the cost of uh, bringing product to market, either from a time or resources perspective, is relatively low, uh, which is, I mean, it's a generalization, but it's true for a lot of the tech companies, and I think that risk improves significantly. Um, you know, just, you know, making the argument from the flip side, from a healthcare perspective, if you need to spend 10 years in the pipeline with clinical investments and such, I think that the question becomes real in, for the company in terms of what's the true norm? Is it the consumer need, customer need, or is it innovation for innovation's sake? Because there's enough examples out there where, again, 
and again, I don't want to create stereotypes, it's like the sales marketing stereotype at the type, but R&D, they have a great idea, this is just a great product idea with no real customer need or insight. Uh, and there are still enough tech companies who can afford that, frankly, because again, the cost, the relative cost, the incremental cost is relatively low to iterate on a platform. Um, but in you know pharma or healthcare in general, you're talking you're talking about multi-million dollar investments. Um, that makes it a you know make it or break it for the company for that year total probably at the end of the day. So I see that convergence a lot more actually in healthcare. And I think the, the real reason is um, you know again what is what is true in our team even afford to come up with a product that the consumer or the customer doesn't need. Um, you really can't. So I think that's that's really the hard question for the company. You know, um, is what is what is true north? Is it really the customer need, or is it is it product as a king? Which again, I think Silicon Valley is still kind of going through that transformation, especially for the for the tech companies. I think for us, marketing doesn't actually sit with sales. Marketing sits under we have two CEOs. Marketing sits with product under one CEO, and sales sits with the other one under the other CEO. So uh, in a way, we separated that. And marketing listens closely to customers and feeds that directly into the product teams. The way that we bridge the two is through what we call pipeline councils and pipeline excellence methodology. And that actually sits in what used to be my team, sales strategy. So it's a sort of unbiased team on the side that says, okay, do we have enough pipe? Is it the right quality? Is it the right quantity? Is it in the right quarter? And which horseman is it coming from? Is it coming from marketing? Is it coming from SRB, the are sort of right inside sales? Is it coming from the account executive? Setting targets of where it should come from and then holding people accountable that it sits outside of the sales and marketing dilemma that kind of connects the two. That's how we've tried to solve it on our side. The other thing that we do as a company is the idea exchange. So anyone using Salesforce can log in and say, actually these are the five features I want developed and you can rate things, you can add your own, you can score for something that someone else has already voted on. And the ones that get the highest scores are the features that then get worked on for the next release. So we're listening directly to the customer and the users in terms of what is needed in the product. Okay, there's a question. I actually live up in the Silicon Forest, so in Oregon. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thanks, Lucia, Ashley, Vinodham, and Payad for arranging this. So I'm really impressed. I mean, they're highly accomplished professionals, right? So my question is, what aspects of your Turkish upbringing or your Turkish kind of cultural identity has helped you in this successful career? Any advice for the rest of us here that you think helped you in, in your journey? I'll maybe take a step. I think the, the practical problem solving capabilities we have is pretty impressive um, compared to a lot of other cultures because they, they really think in very, you know, good rational logical terms, right? So I think there's almost a saying like start like a, you know, a Turk and, and like a Brit or something like that because we, we, we get that excitement, that passion we bring to the discussion is, is great, as well as problem solving, which becomes really real with commercial um, jobs. I mean, it's, it's really, there's no week, maybe not a day, but there's no week that I'm not managing the crisis. You know, you, you make a plan and then something falls apart, right? So, and there are a lot of people who really, you know, break apart with that crisis and they try to put together, you know, plan in a very linear fashion. Uh, or they get into the analysis paralysis mode. I think we have the, that practical problem solving capability. Maybe that's due to the you know, habit of breaking rules on a regular basis <laughs> growing up, which again is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but again, in the commercial roles, I actually find that creative problem solving um, you know, very, very helpful. Because again, again, as you, you know, especially progress in the organizations, it could be the people problem or business problems, but um, it really requires creative problem solving skills versus kind of logical answers, answers to the question. I mean, that's a great aspect. And I would add interpersonal relationships is probably something that we're really good at too, compared to other cultures that are a lot more formal. We can actually get real with people, sit down, have a conversation, and be able to kind of work things, back channel things a little bit easier. So that makes it a lot easier, I think, in terms of getting work done. Um, I also feel like maybe this is a selection bias for the Turks that are actually in the US. Because, you know, similar to the Chinese that are in the US, we've come from a pretty populous country and we've 
you know, fought against odds to come here. So we're ambitious. And that means that when you do a job, you do it well and you do it right and you actually put your best into it and you really take it seriously. And I think that shows vis-a-vis -vis the average American, let's say, who was born here and takes it for granted and is sort of in the mindset, oh, you know, I'll give it a shot and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, no big deal. And that I, you know, I'm here to, to stay. And I think we're constantly saying, if I don't get this right, I'm going to be going back home. So there's that constant like reminder that you, you better get this right. And I think we do a good job. I, I see a lot of people being very diligent in anything that they do compared to someone who's brought up here. Yeah. So perhaps uh, I'll give an example from myself. So in my uh, previous company, they called me, nickname was Razor. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, because I, they think I'm, uh, I'm just a very tough interviewer, um, but you know, if somebody comes in, uh, I'm looking for a senior or a, a, you know, experienced demand gen program manager, right? Uh, so I, uh, I look at the resume already. I look at the LinkedIn profile. I know what they did. So I don't even ask you know what are you doing right now. It's I know already. So one example. Uh, person comes in, I said, okay, I need a demand jam program. Uh, it needs to create half a million dollars of pipeline or MQL, whatever. I give you $100,000, what do you do? Uh, uh, webinars and I do events. And... No, no, how do you approach? What do you do? If you're a 10, 15 year experienced person on this, tell me the approach. Couldn't get it. Uh, then I'm, I'm the razor because uh, and my CEO called me and he's like, "You're interviewing too tough. I can't find people. How am I going to hire these?" Well, maybe you shouldn't hire these people because they don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, it's very practical. I'm just asking, what? How do you approach this? They, you should be able to tell me in two, three minutes. This is what I'm going to do. So that, that that's something we have, I think. Overall, if you don't have it, work on it, and uh, you know we have it inside. <laughs> Just bring it out. <laughs> so, can I sample an answer for that? Sure. Like, can I sample an answer? You, what would your answer be to your oh, question? Yeah. She's interviewing you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so it's all about uh, uh, the approach is all about strategy first, right? I kind of talked about it. So, uh, for, first of all. What are the company goals, right? And what, is, what are the sales goals? How do I align with this overall strategy? Uh, because company tells you, I'm gonna go after my install base first. That's your priority. If I go try to find new companies to sell, to market to, that's not aligned yet. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then who is my audience? You know, What are their pain points? So you start going through, it's almost like a, a guideline, right? A check, a check, uh, you know, checklist. Um, and then you, uh, how do I segment these people? How can I focus on a certain, uh, you know, uh, audience segment so I can target them better? I can make things more relevant. And then how much budget do I have? What are my channels? What are the watering holes? Where do they read stuff? Where do they go? Should, can I go there? Or maybe I should hire someone. So that's really it's an approach. And that's what I wanted to hear. And, and if you don't hear that, you kind of start getting, mm, maybe not. So, I mean, the last bit I want to add, I mean, definitely that being practical. I mean, we are, we are a nation <laughs> who always has a mind, who doesn't mind speaking it up, who has an opinion. So that's definitely something that helps, but hey, one has to also learn to hold those thoughts from time to time. And the second bit, in my opinion, I mean, at least about myself, being warm-blooded, being easily or easily engaging with your audience, with the people, whoever you're interacting with. I would say those are the two things, in my opinion. Okay, I think one question in the back and then one question in the front, and then I think we're gonna open it up to chatting. You guys can ask the panelists questions as well, um, but we're at the top of the hour, so. Last two questions, go ahead, sure. speak loud. Okay. First thing that is I, icebreaker, I work in SAP in customer experience as a salesperson, so I have any difficulties to shut up my mind. We have great events too. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And the second part, we ask about the positive aspect of being from a different culture, from Turkey. 
Is there any negative aspect of the being from the Turkey and HBD being there which you experience and how did you overcome? Like one example which I experienced in the sales, in Turkey we always grow up in the competitive environment, we always have some target page here on OCC and university and job and everything. Then my first company is similar to Giza, I was in Procter and Gamble, we had the culture up or out. You have to either promote or then you are done, you need to leave your role. And when I came to the States with the pre-sales role, now the sales role, you always want to be better in each quarter, but then you are thinking about, okay, you have a journey all the way to 60, 65. Like I, maybe sometimes you don't want to get a new, more responsibility because you are happy on what you are doing, but you have to, otherwise you will step back. Like did you have different kind of difficulties because of being that, coming from that Turkish competitive culture, doing everything and eager to more, and did it affect your career in some part? I'm going to say one thing first, um, just in general being Turkish, I think the biggest barrier is language. Because when you're in a sales and marketing role, they expect you to speak uh, very fluently in their language using their terms, their um, idioms, their common talk. I mean, it's really important. Um, and the same thing, I've worked here in the US and then also in Turkey. And it's key to be able to have something you can kind of talk to just like small talk. And it's difficult when you're not able to do that because then it immediately becomes a product conversation. And as a salesperson, I generally, when you start sentence two that way, it doesn't go well. So language, 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 and learning about common kind of phrases and common like American events, baseball. So Turkish people don't know baseball. Americans love baseball. So you need to lo learn a little bit about baseball. It's like one example. I think I mentioned it in one of the events we did before um, at Salesforce. So uh, my dad's side of the family is Carcassian, and you know we have a saying like, "Oh, sit, you know, sit like a Carcassian girl." Like, you know, you don't speak. You're very polite. You're quiet. You're reserved, and you don't speak unless you're spoken to. Like that. That was the culture that I grew up in, but. That's what they call a wallflower in the US. <laughs> and if you're a wallflower in a meeting, you don't get invited to the second meeting yeah. because you're a wallflower and you just occupied space that wasn't worth it. So you have to learn when to say something. And yeah, I think you had the Boston kiss that should go to you. That was the other thing that our teachers kept saying at school. Oh, don't just speak for the sake of speaking. Yeah, you have to speak for the sake of speaking. <laughs> and every meeting you go to, you have to prepare and say, what's the topic? What is the one thing I absolutely want to say in this meeting? And when do I find the opportunity? If I can't say something else, that's the one thing I absolutely have to say. And make sure you hold yourself accountable to saying that. Otherwise, again, you won't get invited to the next meeting. You won't be respected. You'll be seen as a pushover. And um, especially at a company like Salesforce, where we hire a lot of type A people, you should see our meetings. It's it's not even an environment for introverts. It's just a complete, all these extroverts talking to one another <laughs> and trying to get the last word in. It can be pretty daunting, but you sort of have to get used to that in the US. That's what's valued and rewarded. And um, so that that is a challenge. Two things. Two things. One, uh, Hayat's uh, example, it's a great advice you need to know what the culture is about, right? Really, we all need to know. I need to know uh, where the, the you know Super Bowl is gonna be, right? <laughs> uh, I need to know how SF Giants are doing, and not because I'm in marketing, I have to because I'm in marketing or sales, but also I see young friends here, right? Some of you aren't married yet, I, I assume, I, uh, probably. I got to know this when I got divorced. I'm getting a little bit personal, but back in North Carolina, I didn't care what, I, I play soccer, I watch soccer, I'm a Besiktas fan and all this. Uh, I didn't care, pay attention to American football, who cares? The moment you're alone and you need to start dating and get out and go around and stuff, you need to know that stuff because you're dating American people. So that's what they talk about. Uh, so, so uh, same here, sales and marketing, uh, and anything you do, right, you have to uh, at least be aware of what's going on. The second is this, um, we're kind of, I think you talked about this, you, you say, I mean, we're pretty usually open people. We say what we think. 
Going back to uh, Alcatel days, so we had a uh, meeting, uh, something didn't go wrong, I couldn't deliver, uh, my uh, boss's friend, she's like, I'm <laughs> not making fun of French, but he was really uh, uh, tight. At the end, I'm like, yes, okay, I did it, I am the fault one, I take this, I take the fall. I, I made a mistake. He said, okay, we move on. And then right after the meeting, uh, her name was Munya, Munya Tukali, uh, a colleague of mine, great friend afterwards. He said, Haluk, you never say you made a mistake here. Don't do it, because it will stick with you. And there are other ways to say what, what went wrong and why did it go wrong, and you can analyze it, you can talk to it. But the, never say, okay, oh, it's mine, I take it, maybe it wasn't mine, but it's whatever, you know, I did it. Don't do it, don't say it. It's, I think it's a good advice. I'm not saying you should like, but find ways to kind of explain what happened. Do the analysis and see, uh, show people that you understand. It's a lesson learned. I just want to touch on the, the, the language point a little bit. I think for a lot of us who learned English as a second language in Turkey, uh, coming here you have that inner voice. It's like, it's like the Daniel Mose example in front of the you know, immigration office. It's like you're trying to you know, perfect the sentence with the uh, right tenses and everything initially. So pushing your, yourself out of that comfort zone even in the meetings and just literally making a point just for the sake of making a point. Uh, I think it's important and being comfortable with making mistakes because I think a lot of us, again, it's a selection bias, it's you know, generally a well-educated and ambitious group here in, in the US, you know, um, making mistakes or the idea of possibly making a mistake is, is almost like frightening, which definitely gets into the way from a performance perspective. Um, and in the commercial roles, I think this is true to a certain degree for a lot of the like mid to large size companies. But one great advice I received from a mentor was first time when I came to the US, um, I was almost like this A student. It's like, okay, my, my results at the end of the year is better than everyone else, so I should get promoted. I was thinking very simplistically, because at school, you know, you get an, you go to an exam, if you're the highest scorer, you pass, right? You don't have extracurricular activities in Turkey, you don't get credit for, you know, attending clubs versus here, the rules of the game are completely different. So I think trying to understand the rules of the game, literally from a career perspective, it's slightly different in every company, but it's actually not that different. You know, and she gave me three components uh, to think about, which, you know, the, the, it's a framework, you can look up, it's a pie framework. So performance, image, and exposure. So you know, performance is definitely foundational, important. Of course, you're not going to get ahead, get ahead if you're not delivering, but it's not sufficient. You know, for you to get ahead, which again, for a lot of the Turkish people, it's like, what do you mean? You know, look at my results. If I'm better than the other one, why is he or she getting promoted? And we don't spend enough time in that image and exposure piece. And exposure is really about like building that advocacy in the company, networking, which is definitely not in our second nature. Like we, we don't like to do that usually. Or it takes you know a lot of people you know a lot of time and, and energy to kind of get over that hurdle to say okay no this I have to do it this is part of the job and I think again in commercial jobs it's even more important so I think accepting that sooner than later and just understanding the rules of the game um, is is important. Then I'll add a couple of more things from my perspective. I mean I definitely don't underestimate. I mean you are here in the U.S. That's the language. With that said. If I look at last five to se se last five to seven years, the IT executives about forty plus percent non English speakers. Keep that in mind too. The important aspect to me is the ability to enter, engage in a discussion. That could be anything. You need to be able to break the ice. You need to be able to. Hey, it's not only the product you're selling, and it's not the only reason you are there. Well, maybe for you, that could be the reason. But you need to show the other side some empathy, engage, and whatever that may be. It may be sports, it may be dining, it may be a wine, it may be, well, you pick that, whatever you're good at. You have to be able to engage in that discussion and drive that discussion, create the interest. I can talk about Turkey, okay? History, There's a lot to discuss. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I mean, when I give the example of baseball, I have a lot of customers that are in tech, that are high tech companies. 
So I work with a lot of Indians and, and Asian uh, executives. So I need to know about cricket. I mean, like for me, it doesn't really, it's more about relating to whoever I'm trying to talk to. And if they care about cricket, okay. Like I have, I like sports, so for me, I'm like, okay, let me figure out what cricket is or what time the game is, because they care. And then if you open it up saying, heard it was a good day, you know, he's like, wow, like how does she cares enough to research that topic when normally I don't care about cricket. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is too, is when I said the language thing, I mean, everyone here speaks English and, and probably better than I would say average structured person in America. However, um, it's not just saying something, but it's it, the more important thing is even if you have a great product, even if you have a great thing, it's the way you say it and the way you engage with the audience. That's sales and marketing. So it doesn't matter if you have a great sentence, if you deliver it poorly, nobody will listen. So I just think that's like the most important part, and that's what I meant about language. So Chala, go ahead. One, I just want to add one thing, and it might seem controversial. I don't do it, so I'm, you know, uh, it's probably too late for me to get into it. But one thing I've seen, if you are going to be in sales and marketing, especially sales and carrying a bag, learn how to golf. <laughs> yes. Yes. It doesn't matter. Like even when I look at the women who, who grew the fastest in pure sales roles, it's the ones who knew how to golf. Yes. And who went out on the golf course with the guys. So definitely learn that. That's a good investment. Yeah, begrudgingly I learned. <laughs> So hopefully it's a good closing question. We talked about all the great qualities of Turkish people and um, you're all in very influential positions. You have a lot of um, very smart people coming to um, the US from Turkey, especially in the last decade or even longer. I know um, a few of them here today and it's always hard to get that first job, right? So do you help a fellow Turk? Um, do you try to mentor them? Do you try to give them opportunities? What do you think? I do. I'll, <laughs> I'll ask an example here to get up and speak. I coincidentally run into him here. I'll, yeah, what would you yeah, say? So, uh, he's hired me first after uh, MBA. Um, and funnily enough, uh, he asked me to implement Salesforce. It's not planned. It's not planned. I just need to hear, by the way. So this is 2003. Uh, and he was running sales for the startup and then they invested in Salesforce as their CRM. Um, so I, I implemented Salesforce. I actually put together a marketing program engine. Uh, there was no market or nothing. Um, but yeah, so basically uh, it was all about networking. Um, uh, to your point, like you should speak up, you should let others know that these are my qualities, these are, these are the things that I know, this is my education background. And, Sometimes you may not actually have any um, um, job experience, right? So this was just out of college or uh, in the MBA program. Just highlight your qualities and you know make sure that you're on top of mind. Speak up, uh, and then you know it just happened. And then I'm here uh, working for Salesforce. And let me <laughs> add one thing actually. I always had that vision, a fellow Turkish graduate helping them, bringing them on board. Around the time I brought him on board, I talked to maybe two, three, I introduced you to some of them as well at that time. They were like, mm, I cannot do, the first time, I mean, without experience, you have to start somewhere. That somewhere was compiling data. And I mean, I guess it comes down to, hey, do you consider that step a step down or do you say, hey, I'm going to put my name on this and make it happen. And off was, I'm going to put my name. I had two, three others who said, oh, this is maybe too little for me. I'm not really interested. We have to, I mean, I cannot bring someone with putting them out in the field force and make them rep or solutions engineer. I mean, those are the roles. And I had a marketing role. It's an entry marketing, entry marketing role. But what I'm trying to say hey, that Initial step may not be as appealing always. It all comes down. If you're up for building yourself, I mean, what is your role here now? Up? I was strategy and solutions. So, for the 2016 years later. So, started, but I don't know what happened to the other guys out of college. I, mean, I, I remember them, but I don't know where they are. Oh, to the question, I just want to say one thing. Uh, everyone, these four panelists, do help someone out because I reached out to them and they spent their time this evening to share their stories and to you know, get to know you guys as well. So they definitely, I 
belief in uh, you know uh, helping the Turkish network, um, helping someone out who came to them and, and just emailed them and said, can you come to this event? Um, so that's one thing I just want to say. Yes, and I would say try to be open in the sense that um, a lot of people that reach out to me say, oh, are you hiring? I, you know, I'm still graduating from, you know, Middle East Technical University, and I want a job in San Francisco. Well, we don't hire people without a visa. So, no, I don't have a job for you. Uh, and, and instead of sort of having a more open-ended discussion of what advice do you have for me, I want to get there in five years, what's the path that I should take? And then let's have a conversation because that's a little more possible. Uh, and so I think that you know some more mature companies actually have really good visa programs and sponsorship programs. We actually don't, which is a feedback that I've given to our recruiting team multiple times. But you know, think of it more um, holistically and think about asking for advice and guidance and networking help because we can definitely help with that. And I think there's one thing I've said which was very important, which was talking about your qualities. So when I, you know, receive messages saying, hey, I'm Turkish too, you know, you have a role in the company, you know, can you refer me to it? You know, of course you can mention it at the end. I think after saying, hey, here's how I think I'm qualified, I'd like to get your perspective, do you think this is a good role for me? You know, by the way, <laughs> you know, I am Turkish. Um, but I think it's, we, we kind of do it in extremes. Either we over rely on the fact that, you know, we are Turkish, we got favors from people just because we have a common ethnicity or background. Um, or again, we don't, we don't do it enough. Sometimes I also come across people who are overqualified for the role, but they're so humble, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm asking you for this. You know, be bold. I mean, if you have the qualities, definitely be bold. So I think it's, it's about finding that balance, doing a little bit of a homework so you know what's required and you kind of you know, articulate in a good way why you should, should be chosen. Um, and then ask for advice, definitely, because even if that person cannot give you the job per se, because we might not even be the decision maker or the only decision maker for a lot of the positions in the company, you know, you can still get great advice from, from people who have been you know, in different roles for a long time, so yeah. So um, I'll finish off. Uh, being practical again, if somebody asks you, you know, can you help me? They do a lot, and I try to help people. Um, first, I, uh, I I tell them send me your LinkedIn profile and send me a resume. They have to be almost perfect then to get a job, especially in the Silicon Valley. So I look at the LinkedIn profile and then go back and say, you look look at mine or look at my friends and redo it. Because I can't do everything for you. You have to put in the hours. You have to try. Second, resume. If you're in Turkey, uh, interviewing jobs for uh, in Turkey or in Europe, resume style is really different. A friend of mine sent it to me a couple of months ago. She is. She wants to come here. Uh, it's. It has a lot of information, including. You know, marital status. <laughs> the, the, Driver's the, license. The, the birth, birth date. Almost yeah. like facial identity number and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm like, we don't need to do this stuff here. Tell me what you did, and and by the way, Google the resume, get the template, do it for the U.S. Otherwise, it's too much. I I can't even probably share it because there's too much personal stuff in it. So uh, those two things first, right? And then you go and uh, ask the questions about you know what are you trying to do? People come uh, typically. I want to get a job in the U.S. What the heck do you do? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, so do the tell them, tell your friends, do the work. Uh, they need to be explaining to me in a couple of minutes what they want to do. And by the way, I can't just refer people because I don't know what they do. If I'm hiring, I need to hire that per a person that's really confident to get the job done. I can't just some, hire someone because he or she is Turkish. That's that's the practical side. Okay. Thank you so much everyone. Really